We were on a plane yesterday, and you get a cross-sectional view of humanity. We had a hotel uh, cleaning lady listen to Joyce Meyer in Spanish. You go to hotel or you go to the airport, you see a whole spectrum of people, people who believe in God, people who care less about God, people who are doing everything they can to defy God, and the ignorant masses in between. And as a believer, and as a man of God, it's like truly the harvest is great. The laborers are few. These graphics I make are not just something pretty to look at. We've been talking about sacrifice for weeks. Last week we talked about individual sacrifice. And is there a limit to what you do for God? I'll give, but only so much. Don't ask for anything more. And it, is there some way we put that slide of the book I don't care if it covers me on the camera, on the announcements, the fire and the glory. Creating a habitation of God's glory. Age, they even had a guest minister and they couldn't even get to him because the pastor couldn't get up off the stage. It felt like there was a thousand pounds on him. So when God sits on a service, sits on a person, that's when revival takes place and it gives birth. But the same pastor began to get frustrated because his church, not all of his church, wanted to plug in to the marvelous things that God was doing. And so he kind of chewed them out uh, one, during the announcements and rebuked them, not attending, not giving. And then he saw the glory decrease. And he had a dream that he was sitting on a baby. So when God sits on us, revival takes place. But when we sit on revival, it kills it. I said, God, sit on me. Yeah. T.D. Jakes taught a sermon just like that, the, the donkey going into the triumphal entry. Sit on me, Lord. Creating a habitation. It's built on sacrifice to press in and press through. I want to dovetail on what I said last week about personal sacrifice that I'm going to continue on till, uh, to this phase here. Because there's no sense going on talking about church-wide sacrifice for each other as brothers and sisters if we're not sacrificing before the Lord. Time, energy, and money. Lord, I'll go this far, but not farther. And one of the other things I picked up on the book that I didn't realize before, as he discussed sacrifice as well, is that God is always going to demand more. See, blockages are like this. Mountains get in your way. It's kind of like this. You're on one side, God's on the other. And it's going to take some sacrifice to move that thing out so that God can give you more. So if there's anyone that wants more of God, it's going to require more death. Death to self. Self-sacrifice. Self-martyrdom. He even comes out and says, God seems to be attracted to the smell of burning flesh. You put yourself on the altar and say, God, here I am. And as uh, the sacrifice is made, the first thing they do is they drain the blood. They slit the throat. They drain the blood of that animal. So we're supposed to be drained of our agendas and our, our will. <clears throat> Before we begin this segment, ask yourself if people want to be like you. Does your life on earth reflect the love of God that you have received from above? Is your marriage a good model for others to follow? Is your house a home of harmony? Do your co-workers want to talk to you or do they avoid you? Do your neighbors see a helping hand and a warm smile? When asked, do people want to go to your church? If not, is there a common denominator to some, if not all of the above? Those all reflect the amount of sacrifice that we have made or have not made. It's a choice. Paul says, I die daily. We take up our cross daily and we follow the Lord. 
So as we look at the sacrifice that we've made or not made, that will multiply throughout the church. So I'm looking at us individually, us collectively as the body of Christ, because we're supposed to be connected together. You notice that a leg is not connected to the arm, it's through the torso. We all need each other. And when those parts are missing or those parts are hurting, the whole body is in trouble. And I tell you, the church of Jesus Christ in these last days is hurting and she's in trouble. So it's time for us to get healed individually of our issues, our personal issues, and then come together and help one another. We don't want to be the blind leading the blind. We want to be the strong reaching out a helping hand to this world because we'll never make it to phase three of outreach to the world for revival if we can't get it right in here. I say that collectively. So last week we talked about our, our vertical relationship with God, one-on-one, -on -one, our personal sacrifice. Today we're going to look at the horizontal relationship to our brothers and also leaving a legacy to our children. Do our kids see God at home? Do they see moms and dads loving each other? Do they see prayer in the house? Do the kids know how to pray? Do they know what a Bible is? More than the stories of Noah's Ark, do they know the gravity of the situation? Do they like to come to church or do they feel they have to be drugged to church? These types of things. They're, they're all indicators. I call this a cascade effect. This is from pub, excuse me, personal to public. The church is a reflection of the individual sacrifice. I'm going to say some rather pointed things, but they need to be said. Let not the church be the biggest obstacle, because we can have revival, but we, we must want it enough to sacrifice our desires for it, not only individually, but collectively. Of saying our denomination or our church tradition, this is how we've always done it, and we put God in a box. And God will not be put in any box. So since we have received God's love individually, now we must respond. So therein lies the biggest logjam uh, of conferences. I heard Joyce Myers say over and over again, as long as she's teaching blessings on how to, people can receive from God and just have a better life and increase and better job and all that, people shout an amen. But the more she talks about correction and growing up in God, and even giving to others, it gets quieter and quieter. It's even reflected in the book sales. So it shows that we're not responding. We've become a one-way street. We become a, a, a stream that flows into us, but where there's no outlet, you become a dead sea rather than living waters. Amen? We received Christ's sacrifice when we repented of our sin, meaning of our own unrighteousness, of doing things our own way. But receiving God's love was only to be the first phase. The love of God compels us to share His grace first to our own community. I'll say first to our family. First to our marriage. Because church begins in home. First to our own community, the church around us. We need to get God's love right inside the house of God before we could take Him outside through us. Because tomorrow you'll be going to school, you'll be going to work, and people are going to look at you and they're going to see Jesus. You'll be representing Jesus, whether good or bad, or indifferent to those around us. Our clients, our patients, our neighbors, whoever they are. All taking and not giving is not the gospel. God's message of revival is to flow to us and then through us. So if you only write down two words, write down the word to and through. We're all about the two, but I want to press the issue of the through. Amen. Revival is to be like flowing, the flowing and the life-giving waters of the Jordan River and not the stagnant waters of the Dead Sea, which has no outlet. You've heard the saying, Lord bless me and my four no more. That is a very selfish, unchristlike attitude. The church seems to be her own worst enemy when it comes to evangelism. Why is that? Because of lack of of sacrifice. There is no one out there in the world that would not come to Christ that they would find one believer that's willing to do anything to reach them. If you had x-ray vision and you truly saw the, the state of a person's spirit and their soul, 
If you saw prophetically them walking straight towards the cliff and nothing at the bottom but a lake of hellfire and brimstone that burns forever and ever apart from God, you would be willing to sacrifice for them. You'd be willing to open up your mouth, begin a conversation. I don't care if you're shy. I don't care if you're introvert. I'm the, the chiefest of those. But I intentionally begin to uh, strike up conversations with total strangers. I did it on the plane. We do it with the airport workers, the hotel, management, people in the, the restaurants, whoever they are. I begin to strike up a conversation. And I, I begin to process of habitually breaking that ice. I would just use anything. We're getting on the plane and they pack them in like sardines. And we're clear in the back. We got bumped from a flight. So some, rather than complaining about things, I thank God that maybe there was something wrong with that other plane or that we needed to not be on there, that God was protecting us. Amen. We didn't get in until midnight. But you know what? I'm just glad that I'm here in the house of God. That I have the, priv the privilege of delivering his word. And minister to people. At least talk to them. Get to know their story. Where are you from? And you begin to strike up conversation. And then you could steer that towards the Lord. Because we're going to get to a segment here in the next few weeks. That part of the church's uh, deficiency, what we need, we can't even really do the basics. We're not leading people to the Lord. I say this collectively as the body of Christ. So many of God's people, they don't know how to lead someone to the Lord. They don't know how to cast out a demon. They don't know really what they believe. We heard a stat last night from Joyce Meyer. They conducted a study. They found that 70% of believers would compromise their faith if it meant getting a better position at work or a raise. If we're willing to do that, that's not even... Maintaining what we have, much less a sacrifice. Sister Joyce, she gave her own testimony when she worked in the world for, a, I guess, a trucking firm. The boss told her to, uh, to cook the books, and she refused to do that at the expense of her job. And the boss didn't like it as well, but it turned out that as time went on, she, ended up, she was number two in command. Because he saw that she would not compromise. She, he saw that she was someone that he could trust with his company. What a testimony that is. Whether he ever gave his light to the Lord, he saw someone who was dedicated and committed and consistent. She was willing to sacrifice. She had three children. Well, they had one car. This was back in the day. She had to have that job, but yet she would not compromise. When the world sees carnal behavior coming from spiritual people, such as infighting instead of love and division instead of unity, the enemy doesn't even have to attack us. We are destroying ourselves as a body. Before the world can see Christ in us, we must first see Christ in each other. Let's break the logjam of selfishness so the world can see Jesus in us. Our keynote scripture today is uh, taken from Philippians 2. I call this corporate sacrifice. You need to sacrifice. We need to sacrifice for each other. I didn't get a single amen. I said we need to sacrifice for each other. Yes. The people across the aisle, you need to sacrifice for them. When they're hurting, you need to sacrifice your convenience for them. When they have a need, you need to sacrifice your wallet and bless them. Paul said in verse 2, uh, Philippians 2, Then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with God, with each other. I guess I'm on the right mode here today. I said agreeing with each other. There, I don't think there's any other corporate entity more divided than the house of God. A thousand different flavors of denominations. Even the Baptists can't even get it all together. There uh, must be 50 different flavors of Baptists. There's even independent Baptists. How in the world are you going to be independent and a Baptist? I came from a Baptist background. I, I love them. It's always the first Baptist church. <laughs> 
I think Dr. Ed Young, he has Second Baptist Church in Dallas, Texas. But anyways, wholeheartedly agreeing with each other. When we were at Rama, had a wonderful time at camp meeting, wonderful meetings there, wonderful speakers, uh, wonderful anointing. We have some video clips. That I don't. Uh, I could have had them here today, but uh, I'll show you some other time. In fact, we're going to have a meeting after church, after we dismiss. If you're interested to hear about what happened at camp meeting, we'll just go, go downstairs and have some coffee, and I'll show you the, the videos down there. They're only about 60 seconds long. But how it thrilled my heart to see a whole body. There were a whole section from Africa that flew to Tulsa, Oklahoma to be a camp meeting. We were leaving the hotel room, and I saw a brother standing there in the, the, whatever outfit they have from Africa. You could tell that he, he was not a local. And he's just standing there in the parking lot. So I rolled down the window. I said, are you going to camp meeting? He says, yes. So what are the chances of that? I said, well, come on in. We had a big bus. We rented a small car, but that was one of the many things that didn't work out for us. Ended up with a big bus. Like, okay, now I have a bus ministry. <laughs> Hallelujah. I said, is this your first camp meeting? He says, no, we, he's been coming like eight years throughout the years. Flew from Nigeria to be a camp meeting. I wonder how many locals didn't go. And the people that were most on fire, the, the Africans, wherever they were from, they sat in the same section. They were the most rowdy people, praising God like they're losing their mind. I said, oh God, what an inspiration that is to me. Happy to be there. I'm thinking of the jet lag that they had. They didn't care. Brother didn't even have a car or anything. I think, uh, like what Joyce Meyer was saying about the meetings they had in India, people would walk so far, they just stayed there. They didn't go back and forth. They didn't have a hotel or whatever. They stayed there for the whole duration. They would sleep on the, 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 the concrete or the pavement. Because they were so glad to have the Word of God. They cherished it. To them, it really was no sacrifice. A wholeheartedly agreeing with one another, loving one another. How fast the world would come to God like this if they would simply find a church or believers that love each other. Not just tolerating each other, but celebrating one another. And working together with one mind and purpose. What is that one purpose ought to be? The purpose of God. Not their agenda and their kingdom. Their castles, in other words, rather than the kingdom of God. Don't be selfish in verse 3. Isn't that something? This is an epistle written to the New Testament church. Spirit-filled believers, don't be selfish. I challenge you to skim through your New Testament, especially the epistles, and find out how many corrections it has in there. Don't be this. Don't be that. You think we would get that? We have new creation, new spirits inside of us, re reborn, but yet it says don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. The biggest, the fastest, the richest, whatever, the biggest pile, the most books, be humble. Thinking of others is better than yourselves. I tell you, we go miles with that one. Ask yourself, how can I serve that person? How can I help them? Person needs a ride? Come on in. Total stranger. We didn't get carjacked. He's a brother in the Lord. I was willing to sacrifice that. Someone's that stupid to try to carjack us in the middle of the day. So my God is bigger than that. The fear of the Lord would come upon that person. They would, they would change their mind. They would jump out the window before they would try something like that with us. Because our God protects us. That's why I know that every plane that I'm on will never go down because I'm on it. And we're going to the other side. And we lay hands on them. We plead the blood of Jesus over them. And the staff, the faculty, the pilots, all of them. Think of others better than yourself. So if you take that as a homework assignment, write down the word serve. That will fix every argument you'd ever have when you start serving. It'll fix every jealousy you ever have when you start serving and you put yourself under that person willingly, sacrificially. Even if they already have it, give them some more. Serve that person. It'll break that thing off of your life. 
that critical thinking, that how we profile people just at a glance. You don't know their story. How many times I've found out that a, a thought will come to me, well, this person is thus and such, and we try to put them in the box. And so what I, sometimes I would go to them and strike up a conversation and find out they're not that at all. I said, oh, God, I repent. This is how wedges start. We, we just assume things. We have not been renewed in our mind, in our thinking, as we ought to. That's where bias and prejudice comes from. You've already judged a person. You know nothing about them. Number four, don't look out for your only, don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. We were standing in Dad Hagen's office, trying to just, I was just thanking God for the legacy. And there's a crowd of us. There's a person just totally oblivious, walked right in front of the lady that I was beside, knocked her down. Totally oblivious, so I reached over and caught her to keep her from sliding down the wall. And she's like doing this bit, and I grabbed her. A total stranger. I was like, well, at least you didn't step on me. We live in such a selfish generation. So I was like, how do people even think like that? We're walking through the airport, and unless I was doing like this, people would have smacked right into me. Just like, I'm going over here. This is my destiny. It's like the whole world disappears except for them. I can't even comprehend a mindset like that. So here we have the Bible. Take an interest in others too. Ask them what their story is. Where are you from? How can I pray for you? These types of things. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, what did he do? He sacrificed. He gave up his divine privilege. He took off his divinity, took on the robe of humanity. He gave it up. As God gave Jesus up for us, Jesus gave it up, his divinity up for us. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being when he appeared in human form. When Jesus washed the disciples' feet at the Last Supper, that was the lowest of all possible slave positions. That was the bottom rung of the ladder. When you come to a person's house, they had a person. Uh, anyways, the first person you come to, they washed your feet. That was the lowest rank. That's what Jesus did. He washed the feet of Peter. He washed the feet of Judas. Maybe you need to wash someone's feet. Churches used to have foot washing services. Whatever happened to that? The greatest breakthrough that I've seen in breaking the, the ceiling that was above my life in ministry was during a foot washing service. When you get down on your knees and you're washing someone else's feet, they didn't ask for it. You, you initiated it. I tell you, it, it set off a cascade of anointing of breakthrough in the house. There are multiple churches that were meeting together in this one room, and I, I had a problem with someone that left this house. They were trying to take communion, and there was such an angst in my heart that I knew that I couldn't take communion because my heart wasn't right, because I was not discerning the body of Christ. And I knew what the Bible says, that there would not be sickness come upon me, so I, I've never refused communion before, so what do I do? Because they begin to pass out the elements, so I stopped the service. I stopped the service. It wasn't even this church. It was across town. I stopped the service, and I called this person out. Brought up a chair. I grabbed some of this drinking water. It's all I had, and I washed her feet. I said, you know, when you left this church, I said, you hurt me. How much pent-up hurt and anger and frustration there is, even today in the body of Christ, things that are unsaid, uh, unresolved issues, we're crying out for God's glory on one side, but yet we're clogged up on the inside. The reason that God does not pour out His glory like He wants to is because we can't handle it. We're not ready because we're not willing to sacrifice to go to that one person that you already know. This is not to shame anyone or to browbeat anyone. That was one of the most difficult things I ever did. But it was the greatest breakthrough. It broke something in her. It set her free. It set me free. Amen. 
because the enemy had something lined up on the other side. The next morning I had a business trip to fly across the nation and he was going to try to destroy my life. But God was smart enough. He protected me and he used the path of self-sacrifice and servanthood to set me free. And it gave me an extra level of anointing. That was worth you coming to church right there. If you would serve someone, it will, it will prevent disaster from taking place that the enemy has assigned for your life. He humbled himself in verse 8 in obedience to God. I said he humbled himself in obedience to God. Whether he felt like it or not, do you think Jesus felt uh, in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross? He did not want to go there of his own will. He prayed three times, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass for me. Nevertheless, not my will be done, but thine be done. Jesus' true death to himself took place in the Garden of Gethsemane. When he prayed that, sweating great drops of blood, that's when the battle was won. So then when he was betrayed and he was, his face was spit upon and his back was ripped open, he was betrayed and lied and mocked, he had already won the battle in prayer, in the garden. We, my, my wife and I, we knelt in that garden of Gethsemane years ago. Just imagine what that was like. He humbled himself in obedience to God, died a criminal's death on a cross. That's a God I could praise. That's a God I could worship. That's a God I could support. So when he asked me to, to take up my cross and follow him, yes, Lord. You love me. You gave yourself for me, according to Galatians 2.20. Absolutely, Lord. Well, I, actually, I can't even say absolutely. Uh, I, I will do it on a regular basis. Point number A, receive from the past. I don't know how far we'll get with this. Receive from the past. There are people that have sacrificed for you. As far as Rock Family Church is concerned, we're standing in a building and a ministry that was sacrificed for us. I listened to other Rhema pastors, and they said, How many of you, when you started, you had nothing? And I could not raise my hand because we had everything handed to us. The property was already built. The building was built. We were trained up for 10 years. Hands were laid upon us. There was already uh, savings in the bank. All this, the natural, uh, spiritual, uh, physical, financial, all of that was already there. I said, oh, God, I thank you for that. They sacrifice for you. We need to pay the price to catch the fire. We could read about Smith Wigglesworth, uh, other pioneers of the faith, uh, Charles Finney, the, the Second Reformation and, and uh, 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 Awakenings, excuse me, and those things. But what about today? They sacrificed, and we see how the Welsh Revival and all that, uh, Azusa Street, and the list goes on and on. And we see how all the jails were shut down and, and emptied out. The hospitals were emptied out. Uh, the bars were shut down. It's for real. That's why we don't believe it, because we see everything but. But if you'll get your face and renew your mind and begin to uh, research those things, you find out that God did it before. He could do it again. Those people are no different from today. You read of what the times were like during the times when the revival broke out. It's just like today. Apathy in the church on one side, morality uh, in the pits on the other side. It's just like a lot of things we see today. But there was a, a sacrifice that was made, Ge uh, a godly legacy, generational blessing. During the transition of this ministry, my wife was already pastor. I was ordained as pastor. The hands were laid on me the month, one month before, about 30 days is all I had. And Pastor Amy was in the hospital, so I understood order. 
that I was called to pastor. And then I even asked her who's to be the head pastor because if it was be Pastor Lydia, then I would submit to that. So since she was the founding pastor, she says I was to be the lead pastor. I said, okay. So even then, she's still the founding pastor. So at that transition stage, I didn't know at what point was the baton passed. So she's at Mon General in the hospital bed, family only. So I asked her, I forget the exact words that I used, but she looked at me and she goes, That's when I knew that all my life was up to that point. Laying down things of the world, walk away from corporate America, the, the privileges that I had there, 401k and all that, to the ministry. Without a word being said, she said everything. Pastor Hagen shared how he slept in the, the couch next to uh, Brother Hagen. He had been uh, unresponsive for days. And then uh, he, he woke up about 7 o'clock in the morning. So he said uh, to his dad, since as they were looking, he wasn't speaking, but he was looking in his eyes. He says, Dad, if you want to go on, go on home, it's okay. I'm going to take care of Mom, and I'll take care of the church. So he just exhaled for the last time. It went on to be in heaven. And people that were in tune with the Spirit, they saw, they, they knew the moment that he left his body. And they saw that Jesus personally came to escort Brother Hagen home. It wasn't an angel. Jesus came, and he, he only does this in rare occasions for the generals of the faith. Jesus came personally to escort Dad Hagen home. Sacrificed for Ramah. Uh, for the, this generation. This church would not be here if that one man had not sacrificed over and over again. People look at uh, the ministry today, but they don't, many of them don't know the story of how he started out. Uh, Pastor Hagen, as a teenager, they didn't have enough food to eat. He was basically for years lived on uh, cornbread and soup beans. Try that today for more than a couple days and see the amount of complaints to come up. But he lived like that. So that's how they started out, with nothing. Received from the past. What about church-to-church -church sacrifice? People typically do not value things that cost them nothing. Just because something costs you nothing does not mean that it costs nothing, period. Because someone paid the price... Someone paid the price often, okay, there's a typo on that. Someone paid the price for that. We had a family heirloom that we wanted to pass down to the next generation, offered to this one. They said no. The next one, no. The third one, no. Weren't interested. Diamond ring made out of platinum. It's valuable just by itself. Went to someone else, to, to an in-law. They valued it, so they ended up getting married with that ring. They valued the sacrifice. They valued, they recognized. We're living in a generation, they just turn up their nose. It's, it's not convenient. Can't be bothered, as Pastor Amy used to say. Remember when you were a nobody and you had nothing. See, now we're somebody. Grandmas sacrificed their golden years to raise grandkids. As their kids sacrificed to go to work. Some parents sacrificed their career to homeschool their children. We did that for Joseph. We had no new house. Even to this day, I've never had a new house. I no, didn't have a new car until I was 50 years old. But you know what? You can never buy back time. So I'm glad we did what we did. And I'm glad, and God bless you, for being a godly mom. I'm not saying people are not godly parents if they work. I'm saying this is our story, and I'm glad that we did that. They sacrificed having a new home or a new car in order to pray, pay for even private tuition. Others worked three jobs so their children could have it better than they did. 
Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. sacrificed his freedom and his family's safety for the freedom of future generations. And the list goes on. Pastor Amy handed me the ministry from the hospital room. I'm standing on a platform that I did not have to build, but that does not mean that I value it less. If anything, we should appreciate it more because of God's love who gave the vision to make the ministry happen, happen and also my predecessor who spent the time and energy and money in order to bring it to pass. We we'll have to appreciate it even more because you didn't have to. Amen. This is church to church sacrifice, receiving from those that have gone on before you, those that are still alive today. America's biggest problem is amnesia. We forgot the blessings that have been handed to us with no work on our own. That's why you see Americans spitting in the face of our founding fathers and just totally disregarding the freedom of the press, the gathering of religion, these types of things. Working day and night to try to destroy what we have. Trying to take God out of schools. Worse yet, revisionists have consistently stricken out the element of faith from our history books. As a result, we are losing our heritage and our freedoms. The church is backsliding and the generations bear the fruit of ignorance, indifference, and impotence. We don't know, and we're weak and powerless as a people. We must return to our roots to bear spiritual fruit once again. It's on us. Because regression happened during our watch. We can't change what happened in 1970-whatever, but we have today. But revival is the, the determination to turn things around, even if it means sacrifice. You have a Bible today. Someone sacrificed to translate the Bible into your native tongue. They paid the price. You read about John Hus and uh, William Tyndale and those others. As, they, as the kings of their days, which they thought it was heresy for you to have a Bible, they executed them, drained their blood into a bowl, and dipped the Bible, set it in the bowl full of their blood to where it was halfway soaked up to, halfway to the Bible. And people and historians, they have copies of those Bibles. Those pages are still read with the blood of the martyrs still in it. What about prayer? Someone prayed for you to be saved. They interceded for you when you didn't know your left hand from your right. What about your church? Someone built it, often at great cost. These are things that we take for granted. Drive past a million churches. Even your pastor, someone sacrificed to teach you. They sacrificed their job and career and benefits and family to follow God's will for them to help you. And they were not in it for the money. The fact that you're, you are born again today means that someone witnessed to you. Someone told you about Jesus. So let's not just take all these things and say, well, I'm on my way to heaven. I challenge you and I dare you to buy a copy of the book called Light in the Darkness by Rick Renner. He, he chronologizes the, the martyrdom of the early church, how they were fed to lions. They were burned at the stake. I talked about the blood-stained Bibles of the martyrs. Now today there are more martyrs today than all of history. We have underground churches but they're still growing. They were willing to sacrifice being arrested by communist nations and totalitarian governments in order to worship their God. Many have no Bibles. When was the last time you read your Bible? The end time pressure will only increase. It serves as separation. And I say again, the altars of sacrifice are built on the threshing floors of separation. Is the threshing from the wheat from the chaff. That's where God prepares the altar and the sacrifice to where we must climb willingly and say, Lord, here I am. I give it all to you. Our founding fathers sacrificed their lives for our country. You read the, the Declaration of Independence. They were signing their own death warrant. They refused to ever go back. I said they refused to ever go back to having a life without God, without freedom. They refused to ever go back. That speaks to us today. We ought to never go back. Soldiers sacrifice their lives for freedom. That's why I get so upset sometimes around national holidays such as Memorial Day. They didn't die so we just have a backyard barbecue 
or have another 10% off at the mall. But think about it. We have Thanksgiving and people aren't thankful. We have Christmas and people don't think about Christ. What is up with that? That tells us about our nation. Revival is protected by those who have respected. Revival is protected by those who have respected both its value for today and the power for tomorrow. In order for revival to begin, we must respect the rights that have been sacrificially given to us so that we may freely worship, own a Bible, and share the gospel. It is a privilege for you to tell someone about Christ. Less than one half of Christians vote, but my God, many of them complain. We're not respecting the rights that we have. There was a day, I think it was the 19th Amendment, that allowed the black man to vote because they realized he was not two-thirds of a person. And uh, whatever the amendment that allowed uh, 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 women to vote. So let's take that. Let's vote people in that stand for God. I said that stand for God. That will stand up for your right. That will stand up for the unborn. That will stand up for religious liberty. Rather than spending four years complaining about this one and that one. The deterioration of our society makes it harder to minister the gospel of revival because of the inactivity of many believers due to apathy of the church, where we're not sacrificing. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. Therefore, since we're surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses, people that have gone on before you, witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up, the sins like selfishness. And let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. Honor the past that has been given to you. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross. He had you on his mind. He knew that this day would come. So the cross probably began to get smaller and smaller in his eyes when you became larger and larger in his eyes. He endured the cross, disregarding its shame as he hung there naked, bleeding and dying for you. Now he is seated at the place of honor besides God's throne. Will you honor those who have sacrificed before you? Will you take the torch that burns with the flame of revival and set this world on fire for God? Are you willing to continue the honor of sacrifice for the kingdom of heaven for your generation? Looking at the clock, is it a sacrifice to give me some more time? We learn, receive from your past. Point B, protect the present. I'm looking at these kids today. We have got to protect their generation. The devil is after their mind, after your mind, saying that wrong is right and right is wrong, saying that black is white and white is black, saying that up is down and down is up. We've got to protect them. The world is trying to mold their minds. Even uh, as we run a daycare, I get newsletters, and they say, oh, we have all these new resources and talk about diversity and things like that, and it's trying to warp their minds. And I read the comments. It's like, oh, these are great books, and we're going to incorporate that, and it's going to make the world a better place. I wrote at the bottom, people are born with either XX chromosomes or XY. And that's it. They're not anything else. Men cannot have babies. It's not okay to do this or have that. Got to protect their hearts, protect their minds. They think, well, so what's wrong with that? Everything. Read Romans chapter 1, and you find out what's wrong with that. People are being given up to a depraved mind, a reprobate mind. We're seeing that. I see newscasters, they say, this happened, and I don't understand why. Why would they say this? Why would they do that? It's a reprobate mind. Because of apathy in the church, silence in the pulpit, we are to sacrifice for each other. Sacrifice for one another. How many people in church, they don't even like each other, much less sacrifice. Pay the price to keep the fire. Someone paid the price to give you the fire. You pay the price to keep the fire. Don't drop the baton. Revival lets love win. 
Love is not love. God's love is love. And revival lets God's love win. Sacrificial, unconditional love. Three o'clock in the morning love. Your last dollar love. The last ounce of strength love. Pay the price to love each other. Lay down your lives, your plans, your agendas. Lay down our, I say our anger, our opinions, our bias, the church's fleshly desires and traditions of men so that we could walk in love. It's easy to say amen to this in an air-conditioned room on a Sunday morning, but when you go out there, or even today, what about those people that you don't like to talk to or that you, you just don't seem to click or whatever? Make extra effort to reach out in love. I'm going to make this quick. Uh, this is a whole segment of sacrificial giving in the house. Give one to another. Uh, John 13, excuse me, 15, 13, please. Uh, there is no greater love than to do what? Lay down one's life for one's friend. I thought the connotation was that, was for the world and follow Jesus' example. But Jesus is saying, lay your life down for your brother, for your sister. 1 John 3, 16. We know uh, what real love is because Jesus gave up his life for us. So we ought also ought to give up our lives for our brothers and sisters. The black, the brown, the yellow, the white, the male, the female, the Native American, no matter who they are. The total stranger, they're your brother in Christ. Jesus died for them. If we can't get that right, then you probably don't have much to give to the world. Romans 12, 18 we don't have a slide, but write it down. Paul says, as much as it depends on you, get along with one another. Doesn't mean that you're always going to have grandiose angels singing out from the ceiling because you apologize to someone or something like that. They may refuse your apology. They may turn their back. They may write another nasty gram about you. But you know what? As much as it depends on you, God will set you free. As much as it depends on you. You will not be held captive by someone else's opinion. Oh, I think we do have 1218, don't we? Uh, do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. As much as it depends on you. Boy, that verse set me free more than once. How about you? When things didn't turn out, the storybook ending like you thought it would be. But God will set you free. What about sacrificial giving of money? There's many scriptures about that. I'll just give you one. How the Philippian church gave to God. Philippians 4.18 At the moment I have all I need and more I am generously supplied with the gifts you sent with uh, Epaphroditus. They are a sweet smelling sacrifice. A burnt offering that is acceptable and pleasing to God. Ministers will not be starving if the church should be giving these types of things. Uh, I could give you other scriptures. Acts chapter 10. The, Cornelius gave up an offering to God, and, uh, and, and it touched God so much that God sent Peter to his house, to a Gentile's house, and it opened up the New Testament to the Gentile world. What about the widow's might? She sacrificed and gave all. It's not what you have, it's what you have left over. I want to ask you, what about your giving? Look at your checkbook. Look at your statements. Where is God? Where a man's heart is, there is his treasure. Studies, another set of stats, show that uh, less than 10% of the church even tithe. We could be so much farther. Sacrificial restraint. What about stop fighting each other and stop backbiting each other? Dividing and devour. That's Galatians 5, please, verse 14. For the whole all could be summed up in this one command, love yourself. No, love your neighbor as yourself. I think it's even harder to apply this scripture because we're finding people that don't even love themselves much anymore. Love your neighbor as yourself, but if you're always biting and devouring each other, Watch out. Beware of destroying one another. Doing that on social media. Criticizing. Judging. Comments. These types of things. It's got to stop. And the world sees all this. They're not loving. They're not giving. And you're going to talk to me about this Jesus? You want me to be like you? 
The more we fight and bicker, we stay weak by division. Let's be smarter than the devil. That's why we are weak, because we are divided. We're not discerning the body of Christ. We're not washing their feet. We're not giving them first place. Let's be smarter than our selfish desires and love God more than ourselves. Let's be smarter than our selfish desires and love God more than ourselves. As uh, Jesus told Peter, if you love me, you will feed my sheep. He didn't say, if you love my sheep, feed them. He says, if you love me, you feed my sheep. So how many things we do, not saying I don't love you, I do love you. But primarily, I do things, and we do things because of our love for God. That's the first point. Your relationship with the Lord, and then it'll spread out to the body and then the world. Love God with all our heart means there's nothing left for selfish desires. Thou shalt love the Lord. That's your first commandment. You shall love the Lord, your God, with all of your heart, all of your mind, strength, and body. Then you love your neighbor as yourself. Pour out your heart first to the Lord and then to each other. Let's get beyond the new sports and weather. Pour out your heart. That doesn't mean you tell everyone your life story and all of your problems, but pour out your heart. Be there for someone. When someone's hurting, it's like, well, you know, I, I hope you get over it. I mean, pour out your heart. Be there with them. Here's my number. Call me, text me, anytime. I will stop what I'm doing. I'll help you. Last resort, uh, sacrificial protection of the church. I'll just give you this one. This is called corporate sacrifice. When you give up one disobedient and rebellious church member in order to protect the rest, that's sacrifice there for the body. Cast out of church members. I'll just read it to you. You could write it down. 1 Corinthians, remember the Corinthian church? 5, 7. Paul says, get rid of the old yeast by removing this wicked person from among you. That's sacrifice. This person that wouldn't listen, living in habitual sin. A lot of the church thought it was cute, funny, or whatever. They put up with it. They tolerated it. Paul the apostle who birthed that church would have none of it says, throw them out, excommunicate them, shut the door. Then you will be like fresh batch of dough made without yeast, which is what you really are. And he calls this, Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed for us. I say it respectfully. Jesus died for so much more than what we're seeing in the modern day church. Our sacrificial lamb has been sacrificed for us. So we have to lay down our lives for each other, but it comes a point to where the shepherd protects the flock. Even if it means sacrificing. So we receive from the past, we, we protect the present, now we pay it forward. You sacrifice for the next generation. I challenge every godly parent and grandparent, sacrifice for your children. Sacrifice your finances to raise up uh, a college and a school that they could go to that would honor God, you sacrifice for them, the future generations. The also, more trends show that the, the younger and younger generations, the more modern, the graph always goes down. Their belief in God goes down. goes from the, the boomers to the Gen X, whatever. Uh, you go to Barna.org and, and Pew Research, they're all going to show the same thing. Interest in Bible, a spirit-filled, whatever, it just goes down and down. We were so blessed when we were at Ramah that the whole front of the church was filled with young folk, jumping up and down like they were losing their mind. I said, oh, God, I thank you for restoring my hope in humanity. Hallelujah. More than just Tulsa, Oklahoma, more <laughs> to, that we would have that here. Amen? That's why you need to pray for your children's minister and ministry, the youth and whatnot. They are the future. As we were standing there uh, at 50 years camp meeting, uh, being second generation of the ministry being handed to us, looking at Pastor Hagen, who's also second generation, and how they were looking at their children, they would move on, and how uh, Craig Hagen, their, their two children, Craig and Denise, they said, Mom, Dad, we know that, you know, however long that you're here, Raymond will continue, and even after you pass, we commit before you today on worldwide television that we will continue on the vision after you, and even their children after that, however long till the Lord tarries. Amen. Hallelujah. 
You sacrifice for future generations. You pay the price to send the fire. You pay the price to catch the fire. Pay the price to keep the fire. Now pay the price to continue the fire. What good would revival do our generation if it stops with us? Do your kids see Christ at home? Pay pay the price to pass the, the cross or the baton to the next generation. Every generation needs to be evangelized, and I'm just about done. Every generation needs to be evangelized. I talked to folk about our church. They said, well, what do you do? I'm a minister. Oh, what kind of church? I said, well, we're affiliated with Kenneth Hagin Ministries and fewer and fewer people. I said, do you know who Kenneth Hagin is? It used to be like everyone knew. Now it's kind of like, uh, so the best I can relate to them is like, have you ever heard of Oral Roberts? Uh, yeah, I've heard of him. So, well, he's kind of like him. So, so we're losing that connection. The healing revivals of the 50, the Pentecostal outpourings. We don't know where we come from. How are you going to pass it forward? Maybe they're thinking Hagen's ice cream. I don't know. They don't know anything. Every generation needs to be evangelized. Sacrifice to train your children. They're not always going to want it, but you sacrifice it. Say, this is the way it is, you and my house. This is the way it's going to be. We're going to honor God in this house. This thing, this book's called a Bible. This is God's word to you. This is going to be a house to where we pray. A family, we're going to give thanks to God for our food. We're going to honor him with our finances. This is for me and my house. You will serve the Lord. Even if you have family that's, they're not really raised in God and they come in, they're with you. Before you start shoveling food in your face, Stop. We're going to say, uh, I forget what the (laughs) food prayers that we pray at the daycare. Thank you, you God, for this food. Bless it in Jesus' name. I don't care if they have food in their mouth. Thank you, God, for this food. They're going to learn how to praise and give thanks to God. They're going to do it publicly as well. They're going to learn not to be ashamed of the gospel. Stats go down with every generation, so don't be one of them. You may want to write this down as we begin to close. Revival dies when the chain of sacrifice is broken. Don't let it, don't be the weak link. Don't let revival chain break during your watch. This is why we've got to watch ourselves. We're not too busy to train our kids. We're too busy to read the Bible. We become, I have a note here, train kids versus being too busy or being too apathetic. It's not just the wife's job or the mom's job. Dads, I'm calling you out. Fathers and dads, husbands, I'm calling you out. You are the priest of the house or whoever the, if you're a single or a family of one, you lead yourself. You sacrifice your time, sacrifice your energy and money. Well, I had, I've been at work all day. I work in two jobs. Well, sacrifice. Let your kids see that you value God. Why would they value God if you don't? Drag them to church if you have to. They call it a drug problem. I was drug on Sunday, drug on Wednesday. As Pastor John Hagee said that as a kid. Now he's leading a national and international ministry because his parents drug him to church. So as we begin to leave Mount Moriah, it paves the way to Mount Zion because sacrifice permits worship. Can we have the title? Okay, we already have the title slide. Did you get anything out of this? This is not barking and and yelling at the choir. I'm saying this to all of us. And the more desperate the times come, the greater level of sacrifice we may be called upon. So we've had many weeks and months to condition ourselves to begin to prioritize, begin to say no to some things so we could say yes to more of God. So Father God, I thank you for this house. I thank you for this message. I thank you for this opportunity that we have, this window for revival. We have the possibility of revival during our watch. That we would not just sit in a chair and watch it go by like traffic. Lord, that we would step up like like blind Bart and says, I'm going to stop everything and I'm going to get God's attention because I want revival in my life, my family. I love them so much, Lord. I'm not going to watch them go to hell. I'm not going to let them be a statistic and lose this and lose that. We're not going to lose our country, Father God. We're not going to lose our churches. We're not going to lose our pulpits, our freedom. We're going to respect the blood so much and honor you, Lord, that we will do whatever it takes. 
So, Lord, I thank for the grace to change as never before because we're running out of time. You're going to come back for a bride who's made herself ready. We're going to iron out our own wrinkles, our own spots. We're going to wash someone's foot. We're going to buy them something. We're going to be the hands and feet of Jesus. And, Lord, you're going to break shackles off of people's lives. Those unresolved issues, it's going to be broken in just a moment. We thank for the victory a new level that's about to come in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 We'll go ahead and sign off at this point. I hope you got something out of this. I need to stop saying.